Thank you, John, for that very overly gracious introduction. Nothing challenges the rationality of our belief in God or tests our faith in him more severely than human suffering and wickedness. Both are pervasive in our common experience. If this is not immediately evident, a glance at the morning paper or the evening news will make it so. On the larger scale, and at the moment, names like Oklahoma City, Columbine, Kosovo, and Turkey evoke image upon image of unspeakable human cruelty or grief. But Auschwitz or Belzen still haunt our memories. Closer to home, who can fathom the anguish of family members in West Valley? when they discovered their precious little girls suffocated together in the trunk of an automobile, the tragic outcome of an innocent game of hide-and-seek, or the trauma of a dear friend of mine and his five young children who day by day for several months watched their lovely wife and mother wither down to an emaciated skeleton of 85 pounds as she endured a slow and painful death from inoperable cancer of the throat. Scenes like these are repeated daily, a thousand and a thousand times. But we need not speak only of the sufferings of others. Few of us here will escape deep anguish, for it is apparently no respecter of persons and comes in many guises arising out of our experience of incurable or debilitating disease, mental illness, broken homes, child and spouse abuse, rape, wayward loved ones, tragic accidents, untimely death. The list goes on and on. No doubt many of us have already cried out, Why, God, why? And many of us, often on behalf of a loved one, have already pleaded, please, God, please help, and then wondered, as seemingly the only response we have heard has been a deafening silence. All of us have struggled, or likely will, in a very personal way with the problem of evil. I say the problem of evil but actually there are many. Today I want to consider with you just three that I will call, one, the logical problem of evil, two, the soteriological problem of evil, and three, the practical problem of evil. The logical problem is the apparent contradiction between the world's evils and an all-loving, all-powerful creator. The soteriological problem is the apparent contradiction between certain Christian concepts of salvation and a loving Heavenly Father. The practical problem is the challenge of living trustingly and faithfully in the face of what personally seems to be overwhelming evil. Soaked as it is with human suffering and moral evil, how is it possible that our world is the work of an almighty, perfectly loving creator? So stated, the logical problem of evil poses a puzzle of deep perplexity. But the conundrum evoked by our reflection on this question appears to be more than just a paradox. We seem to stare contradiction right in the face. The ancient philosopher Epicurus framed the problem in the form of a logical dilemma. Either God is unwilling to prevent the evils that occur, or he is unable. If he is unwilling, then he cannot be perfectly good. If he is unable, then he cannot be all-powerful. Whence then evil? An 18th century skeptic, David Hume, expressed the contradiction in much the same way. Why is there any misery at all in the world? Surely not by chance. From some cause, then. Is it due to the intention of the deity? But he is perfectly benevolent. 
Is it then contrary to his intention? But he is almighty. Nothing can shake the solidity of this reasoning, so short, so clear, and so decisive. Hume's succinct statement has since provided the framework within, within which the logical problem of evil has been discussed. However, I believe Hume's way of formulating the problem is far too narrow, unjust to both challenger and defender of belief in God, especially to the Christian defender. I do not believe that for the challenger intent on disproving God's existence, the problem has been stated in its starkest terms. For in addition to affirming that God is perfectly good and all-powerful, Traditional Christian theologians commonly affirm two additional, pro two additional propositions which intensify the problem. Three, God created all things absolutely, that is, out of nothing. And four, God has absolute foreknowledge of all the outcomes of his creative choices. While apologists for belief in God have labored long and well, to reconcile the world's evil with God's goodness and power, they have often overlooked the much more difficult task of reconciling evil not only with his goodness and power, but with his absolute creation and absolute foreknowledge as well. 20th century English philosopher Anthony Flew takes these additional premises into account in arguing that any such reconciliation is impossible. It is perfectly proper in the face of apparently pointless evil, he says, to first look for a saving explanation, which will show that in spite of appearances, there really is a God who loves us. But Flew claims believers have assigned God attributes which block a saving explanation altogether. We cannot say that God would like to help but cannot, God is omnipotent. We cannot say that he would help if he only knew. God is omniscient. We cannot say that he is not responsible for the wickedness of others. God creates those others. Indeed, an omnipotent, omniscient God must be an accessory before and during the fact to every human misdeed as well as being responsible for every non-moral defect in the universe." End of quote. To state Flew's point differently, if God creates all things, including finite agents, absolutely, that is, he creates them out of nothing, knowing beforehand all the actual future consequences of his creative choices, then he is an accessory before the fact and ultimately responsible for every defect in the universe. And if, as some believers allege, some human beings will suffer endlessly in hell, God is also at least jointly responsible for these horrendous outcomes. But if so, how can he possibly be perfectly loving? Given the traditional understanding of God, Whatever our consistency saving strategies, in the end, I believe we must candidly confess that they are not very convincing. On the other hand, this exclusive focus on reconciling evil with just a set of divine attributes is unfair to the Christian defender, for it fails to acknowledge the incarnation of God the Son in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and his triumph over suffering sin and death through his atonement and resurrection. Any Christian account of the problem of evil which fails to consider this, Christ's mission to overcome the evil we experience, will be but a pale abstraction of what it could and should be. I propose then to consider the problem of evil from this broader perspective, confronting it in terms of its starkest statement, but also in terms of its strongest possible solution, a worldview centered in the saving acts of Jesus Christ. 
The prophet Joseph Smith received revealed insights which do address the problem of evil in its broadest terms. His revelations suggest what might be called a soul-making theodicy centered within a distinctively Christian soteriology, our doctrine of salvation, but both framed within a theology that rejects absolute creation and consequently rejects the philosophical definition of divine omnipotence, which affirms that there are no, are no non-logical limits to what God can do. The prophet's worldview, I believe, dissolves the logical and soteriological problems of evil while infusing with meaning and hope our personal struggles with suffering, sin, and death. To show that this is so is my purpose this morning. Theodicy, literally God's justice, is the attempt to reconcile God's goodness with the evils that occur in the world. In coming to appreciate the power of the prophet's revealed insights for such reconciliation, it will be instructive to compare and contrast them with the theodicy developed by contemporary philosopher John Hick in his fine book, Evil and the God of Love which is recognized as the watershed work on the problem of evil. In Evil and the God of Love, Hick constructs a soul-making theodicy which retains the doctrine of absolute creation. The soul-making component in Hick's theodicy is highly reminiscent of Joseph's revelations. Both affirm that God's fundamental purpose in creating us and our world environment include, first, enabling us as morally and spiritually immature agents, yet created in the image of God, to develop into God's likeness. And second, enabling us to enter into an authentic, that is, a free and uncompelled relationship of love and fellowship with God. To achieve these ends, Hick says, God endowed us with the power of self-determination, or what he calls incompatibilist freedom. And to preserve that freedom, epistemically distanced us from himself. God effects that distancing, Hicks suggests, by having us emerge as largely self-centered creatures out of a naturalistic evolutionary process or as Joseph maintains, by God's veiling our memory of our premortal existence. God also endowed us, Hick says, with a rudimentary awareness of him and some tendency towards self-transcendence. The prophet identifies this awareness and predisposition as the light of Christ, which enlighteneth every man who cometh into the world. Soul-making, that is, development into the moral and spiritual likeness of God, occurs as we overcome our self-centeredness by making moral choices within an environment fraught with hardship, pain, and suffering. To this point, Hick and Joseph's understanding seems strikingly similar. With respect to creation, however, Hick and the prophet maintain decidedly different positions. Hick affirms absolute creation or creation out of nothing, while Joseph denies it. And this difference brings us to a major point of this address. With his affirmation of absolute creation, Hick affirms all four theological postulates, perfect goodness, absolute power, absolute foreknowledge, and absolute creation which confront him head-on with Flew's divine complicity argument. And Hick sees as clearly as Flew and explicitly acknowledges the logical consequence of this position. God is ultimately responsible for all the evil that occurs in the world. Hick explains why this is so. One whose action A is the primary and necessary precondition for a certain occurrence O 
all other direct conditions for O being contingent upon A may be said to be responsible for O if he performs A in awareness of its relation to O and if he also is aware that given A, the subordinate conditions will be fulfilled. God's decision to create the existing universe was the primary and necessary precondition for the occurrence of evil, all other conditions being contingent upon this, and he took his decision in awareness of all that would flow from it. But given Hicks' admission that God is ultimately responsible for all the evil that occurs in the world, how can Hick claim that God is perfectly loving? Hick sees one and only one way out. His avenue of escape is through appeal to a doctrine of universal salvation. On Hick's view, all of us will finally achieve an authentic relationship with God in a post-mortal life, the value of which will far outweigh any finite evil suffered here. He explains, We must thus affirm in faith that there will, in the final accounting, be no personal life that is unperfected and no suffering that has not eventually become a phase in the fulfillment of God's good purpose. Only so, I suggest, is it possible to believe both in the perfect goodness of God and in his unlimited capacity to perform his will. For if there are finally wasted lives and finally unredeemed sufferings, either God is not perfect in love or he is not sovereign in rule over his creation. End of quote. Though I personally find Hicks' way out appealing, his scriptural warrant is questionable, and it engenders conceptual difficulties of its own. Let us consider briefly just two. First, Though on Hick's view, God endows us with a strong power of self-determination, it doesn't follow from his view that our choices occur in a vacuum. They are always choices of particular persons with particular natures. Recall that Hick describes our primordial nature as being largely self-centered, with a rudimentary awareness of God and some slight tendency toward morality. Since on Hick's account, God creates out of nothing these primal natures, or alternatively the world process which invariably produces them, I see no reason, given Hick's assumptions, why God could not have made us significantly better than we are. Why not, for example, some significant reduction in our sometimes seemingly overwhelming tendencies toward self-centeredness? or some significant increase in our natural aversion to violence. Such creative choices on God's part might have narrowed somewhat the options over which our own choices might range, but would apparently negate neither the incompatibilist freedom nor the soul-making objectives. Seemingly, Hick's absolute creator could have made a much better world than ours. Two. On the other hand, it's hard to see how it can be certain, as it claims, that God, without compromising anyone's freedom, will inevitably lure every finite agent into loving relationship with himself. Given that, on Hick's view, we must have freedom in order to enter into an authentic personal relationship with God, how can it be certain that there won't be rebels to the end? C.S. Lewis suggested that the gates to hell remain forever locked, but on the inside. How can this possibility be precluded? Hicks suggests that while it is not theoretically, it is practically precluded because God has formed the free human person with a nature that can find its perfect fulfillment and happiness only an active enjoyment of the infinite good of the Creator. He is not then trying to force or entice a creature against the grain of their nature, 
but to render them free to follow their own deepest desire, which can only lead them to himself. For he has made them for himself, and their hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. End of quote. But now Hick is waffling, for it appears that we are not free after all. If so, Hick's position is inconsistent. To account for moral evil, Hick posits God giving us genuine freedom and and independence to choose for ourselves, even contrary to his desires for us. But given his affirmation of absolute creation and absolute foreknowledge, he sees that God's perfect goodness is possible only if not one soul is lost. To salvage God's goodness, then, Hick is forced to undermine his free will defense. Hick's way out, as appealing as it may seem, also seems to be incoherent. Joseph's way out. Joseph's way out of the conceptual incoherency generated by the traditional premises is not to go in. His revelations circumvent the theoretical problem of evil by denying the troublemaking postulate of absolute creation and consequently the classical definition of divine omnipotence. Contrary to classical Christian thought, Joseph explicitly affirmed that there are entities and structures which are co-eternal with God himself. On my reading of Joseph's discourse, these eternal entities include chaotic matter, intelligences, or what I will call primal persons, and law-like structures or principles. According to Smith, God's creative activity consists in bringing order out of disorder, in organizing a cosmos out of chaos, not in the production of something out of nothing. Two statements from Joseph's King Follett sermon should give some sense of how radically his understanding of creation departs from the classical Christian notion. With respect to creation, Joseph wrote, You ask the learned doctors why they say the world was made out of nothing, and they will answer, Doesn't the Bible say he created the world? And they infer from the word create that it must have been out of nothing. Now the word create came from the Hebrew word barau, which does not mean to create which does not mean to create out of nothing. It means to organize the world out of chaos, chaotic matter. Element had an existence from the time God had. The pure principles of element are principles which can never be destroyed. They may be organized and reorganized, but not destroyed. They had no beginning and can have no end. More particularly with respect to the creation of man, Joseph added, the mind of man, the immortal spirit, where did it come from? All learned men and doctors of divinity say that God created in the beginning, but it is not so. I am going to tell you of things more noble. We say that God himself is a self-existent being, But who told you that man does not exist upon the same principle? Man does exist upon the same principle. God made a tabernacle and put a spirit into it, and it became a living soul. How does it read in the Hebrew? It does not say that God created the spirit of man. It says God made man out of the earth and put into him Adam's spirit, and so became a living body. The mind or the spirit or the intelligence of man is co-eternal with God himself. Elsewhere, Joseph taught that there are also laws of eternal and self-existent principles, normative structures of some kind, I take it, that constitute things as they eternally are. What are possible instances of such laws or principles? Lehi, I believe, makes reference to some such principles in the enlightening explanation of evil that he gave to his son Jacob. 
as recorded in 2 Nephi chapter 2 of the Book of Mormon. I call that explanation Lehi's theodicy. Adam fell that men might be, Lehi tells Jacob, and men are that they might have joy. But to attain this joy, Lehi explains, it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, righteousness could not be brought to pass. Neither wickedness nor holiness, neither good nor bad, neither happiness nor misery. And so, to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, after he had created our first parents, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other being bitter. Wherefore, the Lord gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore, men could not act for, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. According to Lehi, then, there are apparently states of affairs which even God, though omnipotent, cannot bring about. Man is that he might have joy, but even God cannot bring about joy without moral righteousness. Moral righteousness without moral freedom. Moral freedom without an opposition in all things. With moral freedom as an essential variable in the divine equation for man, two consequences stand out saliently. First, the inevitability of moral evil. And second, the need for a redeemer. If my interpretation of 2 Nephi 2 is correct, then it seems as if we ought to reject the classical definition of omnipotence in favor of an understanding that fits better with the inspired text. Given that text, how ought we understand divine omnipotence? B. H. Roberts plausibly proposed, I believe, that God's omnipotence be understood as the power to bring about any state of affairs consistent with the natures of eternal existences. So understood, we can coherently adopt an instrumentalist view of evil, wherein pain, suffering, and opposition become the means of moral and spiritual development. God cannot prevent evil without preventing greater goods, soul-making, joy, eternal, that is, godlike life. Armed with this definition of divine omnipotence, at least as a working theological hypothesis, and with Joseph's explicit repudi repudiation of the doctrine of creation out of nothing, let us consider again the logical problem of evil and Flew's argument charging God with complicity in all the world's evil. From the prophet's theological platform, as I have construed it, it does not follow that God is the total or even the ultimate explanation of all else. Thus, it is not an implication of Joseph's worldview that God is an accessory before the fact to all the world's evil. Nor does it follow that God is responsible for every defect that occurs in the world. Within a framework of eternal entities and structures which God did not create, it seems to me that the logical problem of evil is dissolved. Evil is not logically inconsistent with the existence of God. Within the prophet's worldview, there can be saving explanations of the world's evil, explanations which in no way impugn God's loving kindness. To see what such explanations might be like, we need to fill out the picture considerably. And to do so, it will be useful to move from argument and analysis to narrative. Time does not allow me to do this. But I invite each of you in reflecting on these matters to rehearse once again the old, familiar, and yet ever new and renewing story 
of the plan of salvation. To do so is to articulate a Mormon theodicy. Earlier, when I first introduced the logical problem of evil, I argued that most discussions of the problem were too narrow and especially unfair to the Christian believer in that they failed to take into account the problem's strongest possible solution, the incarnation of God the Son in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and his triumph over sin, suffering, and death through his atonement and resurrection. But ironically... What I referred to as the strongest possible solution to the problem of evil, when understood in some traditional terms, becomes itself part of the problem. How can this be? This, the soteriological problem, arises out of the New Testament teaching that salvation comes through and only through Christ. For instance, John reports Jesus as having claimed this very thing. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Similarly, Paul, there is only one name under heaven whereby man can be saved, the man Christ Jesus. Thomas Morris, professor of philosophy at Notre Dame, in his book, The Logic of God Incarnate, discusses the difficulty that Paul's teaching gives rise to. In fact, he calls it a scandal. Quoting Morris, The scandal arises with a simple set of questions asked of the Christian theologian who claims that it is only through the life and death of God incarnated in Jesus Christ that all can be saved and reconciled to God. How can the many humans who lived and died before the time of Christ be saved through him? They surely cannot be held accountable for, respond, for responding appropriately to something of which they could have no knowledge. Furthermore, what about all the people who have lived since the time of Christ in cultures with different religious traditions untouched by the Christian gospel? How can they be excluded fairly from a salvation not ever really available to them? How could a just God set up a particular condition of salvation, the highest end of human life possible, which was and is inaccessible to most people? Is not the love of God better understood as universal rather than as limited to a mediation through one particular individual? Jesus of Nazareth, is it not a moral as well as a religious scandal to claim otherwise? The problem can be stated in the form of an inconsistent triad, a set of three premises, all of which are apparently true, yet the conjunction of any two of which seemingly entails the denial of the third. One, God is perfectly loving and fair and desires all of his children to be saved. Two, salvation comes only in and through acceptance of Christ. Three, millions of God's children have lived and died without ever hearing of Christ. Three is indisputable. Forcing us, it seems, to give up either one or two, both of which seem clearly warranted on biblical authority. So how to resolve the puzzle? Many of you in this audience are no doubt smiling, recognizing that adding a premise four to the triad solves the puzzle. Four, those who live and die without having a chance to respond positively to the gospel of Jesus Christ will have that chance postmortemly. Thank God for Joseph Smith, not for resolving one more thorny problem of evil, which he surely did, or God did through him, but for being the instrument through whom God restored the knowledge and priesthood power that makes the redemption of the dead possible. Elder John Taylor wrote truly when he penned the words, Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in the world than any other man that ever lived in it. 
I want to finish by considering the prophet's contribution to one more problem of evil, the practical problem of living trustingly and faithfully in the face of what personally seems to be overwhelming evil. Joseph left us much by way of a revelation that speaks to this problem of evil, but perhaps his own life speaks more powerfully than his words. Joseph was no stranger to sorrow. He speaks, though inspired by God, from the crucible of his own experience. In section 127 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the prophet reflects, The envy and wrath of man have been my common lot all the days of my life. Deep water is what I am wont to swim in. Indeed, Joseph faced continual persecution. He was tarred and feathered, subjected to numerous lawsuits, confined to intolerable conditions in dungeon-like jails. He was deeply affected by the death of his brother Alvin. His brother Don Cor Carlos and his father also died prematurely. Four of his 11 children, including twin sons, died at childbirth, and a fifth died at 14 months. Joseph was never financially well-to-do and often lived in poverty. For much of his life, he had no regular place to call home. After the failure of the bank in Kirtland, many of what he considered to be dear friends turned against him. It was members of the church who published the Nauvoo Expositor, for the purpose of denouncing him, and this eventually led to his martyrdom. Even he, who walked so closely with God, on occasions in his life encountered the troubling experience of God's absence when he felt God should have been there for him. A case in point, the dark days of 1838 when the Latter-day Saints were driven from Missouri. The setting was as follows. A vast number of Mormon families had been burned out of their homes by mobs. Fathers were tied to trees and bullwhipped. Thirty-four people, including men and, uh, men and children, had been massacred at a settlement known as Hans Mill. Shortly thereafter, the Mormon settlement at Far West Missouri was seized and sacked by the state militia. Soldiers raped some of the women so many times that it killed them. Joseph had been betrayed by a friend and turned over to, over to military mobsters to be killed. He was taken to a small dungeon called Liberty Jail. During the four months of imprisonment, Joseph and his companions were abused, fed human flesh, and left in filthy conditions. Joseph felt abandoned by God. Joseph the prophet. In a prayer, Joseph questioned from the depths of his soul, O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed, and thine eye, yea, thy pure eye, beheld, behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people? In response to this prayer of the soul's desperation, Joseph heard God. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man has descended Below them all, art thou greater than he? Confronted with what seemed overwhelming evil, Joseph found meaning, maintained hope, trusted God, and kept the faith. And God spoke peace. As I peruse the philosophical literature on the problem of evil and note men's perplexities, and then as I ponder once more the revelations and teachings of Joseph Smith, I am amazed. 
Joseph had no training in theology, no doctor of divinity degree. His formal education was scanty at best. And yet, through him comes light that dissolves the profoundest paradoxes and strengthens and edifies me in my own personal trials. The world calls Joseph an enigma. I know that the inspiration of the Almighty gave him inspiration. He was a prophet of God. Of this I bear witness in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.